So sorry for the delay uh, with the technical issues are not solved yet. Um, so second session for the day with the tutorial starting with Jeffrey Dooling. Um, I will introduce you a short moment. Jeff uh, started his career at the Pennsylvania State University in 1980 receiving his bachelor and 87 receiving his PhD. Jeff's introduction to particle accelerator and diagnostics came early during the development of RF driven sources for neutral beam plasma diagnostics while he was working for JCOR. Later in 96, he joined the uh, accelerator group of Argonne National Laboratory's intense pulse neutron source division. In 27, he joined the APS accelerator system division and began working on beam loss simulations. Jeff is presently leading an effort to combine particle matter interaction, hydrodynamic and beam dynamics code to yield a reliable multiphysics model um, that can guide the development of collimators for high energy density beams. Jeff enjoys sailing, astronomy, hiking, and keeps trying to learn surfing, which makes results, he told me. <laughs> At least he showed me pictures where he was really standing on the board. <laughs> so thanks for that. <laughs> um, so Jeff, it's now time to give us your tutorial about, not about surfing, but uh, about collimation and machine protection for low uh, emittance rings. So Jeff, please start. Thank you, Kay. Okay, I want to thank the scientific program committee for inviting me to give a tutorial. There'll be a quiz at the end, so please pay attention. Just kidding. So, uh, okay. I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors, uh, both at Argonne and uh, elsewhere, as well as colleagues at Argonne and uh, colleagues uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, they've been very helpful and uh, have provided some very good information uh, for, this, for this talk. So it's an outline of my talk. After an introduction, I'll just give different examples of uh, machine protection systems, strategies for protection of APSU chambers and collimators, uh, a couple of code simulations as well as uh, lost study data and a, summer, a summary. So ultra low emittance high intensity electron beams and fourth generation storage rings uh, are capable of causing high energy density um, interactions on technical surfaces such as uh, collimators and uh, vacuum chamber walls. Uh, high energy density is basically defined as energy densities exceeding 10 to the 11th joules per cubic meter. Uh, this works out to be approximately uh, 37 megagray for aluminum, uh, 11 megagray in copper, and about 5.2 megagray in tungsten uh, as an acute dose. Now, acute has uh, maybe an ambiguous meaning, but it implies that the duration of the deposition is short. And how short? Well, basically a rule of thumb might be to compare it with the thermal diffusion time uh, from the heat equation, uh, which is L squared over alpha, or L squared is a characteristic length, and uh, alpha is uh, diffusivity. Now, uh, diffusivity can change quite a bit uh, depending upon the state of matter. As it, uh, aluminum changes from uh, a solid to a liquid, diffusivity drops by a factor of two. And as it changes from a solid into uh, warm, dense matter, it changes uh, even more, but more like a factor of four or five. So whereas uh, diffusivity can help uh, with diffusing some of the heat, in fact, uh, that's not always the case as, as things get hot and, uh, get, uh, and their state changes. So first of all, let me give you some uh, MPS examples, starting with the advanced photon source. We are going to be uh, changing the uh, lattice in the storage ring uh, to bring it to a fourth generation uh, storage ring by replacing every magnet in the in the storage ring tunnel, going from a double bend acromat to a multi bend acromat, basically uh, seven uh, dipole structures uh, per uh, uh, per sector, and then um, well in the in the in the lattice. So what I'm showing. Uh, oh yeah, okay. So this this of course is our ring. We have uh, an injector, LINAC PAR, and booster, and then inject into our storage ring. All of these magnets will be replaced. Over on the right is the uh, 
topology basically for our, let's see, backwards here, for the MPS system where uh, the local uh, MPS is, uh, covers two sectors and feeds into the central uh, in the MCR, uh, the main control room. Now the MCR is actually uh, located uh, sort of at the north end of the, uh, uh, of the storage ring. So uh, there's different latencies in terms of the length, uh, the time of flight uh, that the signals have to go from uh, BPLDs uh, back to the, the storage ring. So uh, we have uh, fast uh, data links that uh, handle that in the case of uh, the new uh, MPS topology. Basically, uh, we have BPLDs that will uh, tell the system when to trip, when beam gets out of uh, range of the uh, uh, stable range that we want to keep it in horizontally and vertically. For the MP APS, NPS, APS, UMPS, uh, there's basically two fill patterns we have to worry about. There's a 24 bunch timing mode and a 324 bunch brightness mode. Uh, both will operate at 200 milliamps and 6 GeV. With machine circumference of 1104 meters, uh, the period is about 3.68 microseconds. The stored energy is 4.4 kilojoules, which works out to a, a circulating power of 1.4 gigawatts. Of course, power densities, uh, instantaneous power densities can be much higher, and in, uh, and uh, are really what's important. And in our loss studies, we reached uh, power densities up to about t uh, almost 10 to the 14th watts per square millimeter. And, and that's uh, enough to cause some serious damage in the aluminum collimators. And I'll show, I'll show you that uh, briefly, uh, shortly. So just showing, sorry, it's probably very hard to read. I apologize for that. But basically the topology for our, the structure for our, our uh, uh, main uh, MPS, we have uh, front end, uh, input uh, from our uh, equipment protection as well as your, your normal uh, vacuum and water go into our, the FPGAs. Uh, then also uh, f there's a fast, the logic here is shown on the, on the uh, right. Basically there's a, a fast data uh, link from our local FPGAs, the local MPS uh, for the BPLDs that give us uh, to tell the machine when to trip when it's necessary. Uh, again, the locals are looking at the, uh, at the BPLDs in each one of their sectors as well as uh, the, the, there's a bunch lengthening system that goes actually into the main uh, which keeps the, uh, the bunch long. We need to do that for stability. Uh, and uh, so this is a hierarchical system as most MPS systems are. Uh, Comparing this with uh, electron ion collider, which is pre uh, being constructed at, uh, at Brookhaven National Laboratory in the relativistic heavy ion collider tunnel, uh, they are going to add uh, an electron source, including polarized electrons, uh, and a rapidly cy cy cycling synchrotron or RCS for, for the electrons. Also, uh, of course, uh, a storage ring, and they're planning on operating at three energies, 5, 10, and 18 GeV. At 10 GeV, the electron beam will circulate with the highest stored energy, uh, 1160, 27.5 uh, nanocoulomb bunches with a total stored energy of 320 uh, kilojoules, averaging an average circulating power of, uh, of 29, 24, almost 25 gigawatts. Again, power densities are what really matter in this case. Uh, because the bunches will be relatively small, they're going to be melting metal if they're, if they're striking a uh, vacuum chamber. So that's an issue that they have to deal with. Um, also, their, their hadron beams or proton beams will have uh, parameters similar to the uh, post uh, LHC injector upgrade. Uh, and and uh, I thank Angelica Dries for this uh, information. Other com um, complexes reported issues, super KKB experienced uh, instabilities in their, uh, in their ring, and that led to collimator damage and limited, uh, limited their beam currents. LHC uh, is switching uh, their collimators to molybdenum of graphite to improve their impedance. 
So the LHC, uh, I'm sorry, the EIC components, uh, basically what I wanted to show here is that uh, there's going to be a dump line, a dedicated dump line. Uh, in, for example, in APS we don't, we, we don't do that. We're going to try and uh, just use our collimators internal to the, uh, uh, the vacuum vessel. But here with the energies that they uh, are uh, foreseed, foreseen in the EIC, a dedicated dump line will be used for the uh, electron beam. In this uh, uh, interaction region two is where they will have this uh, dump line. Um, and basically it's an unused spectrometer tunnel and allows the 300 kilojoule beam to be extracted uh, without damaging uh, components in the rest of the ring. Uh, so it, this basically shows the, uh, the, the magnet arrangement using kickers and a Lambertson magnet to deflect beam down, down into the spectrometer line. As far as the, uh, how they actually have to, can run the machine, uh, the hadro hadronic storage ring takes 35 minutes to fill. Uh, in the case of an uh, electron storage ring abort, uh, the beam can, they can keep the hadron beam. Uh, however, that can't be true if they uh, lose the hadron beam. The, the, the reverse isn't true. The electron beam has to be dumped, and that's because the electrons can't survive the hadron beam ramp um, due to the changing of revolu revolution frequency. So in that case, they have to dump the electron beam. And so it's important that they do that carefully. Uh, let's see. So let me next talk. This is an, uh, a, this of course is a LINAC. This is the PIP2 uh, LINAC and uh, beam transport line at Fermilab. Uh, thanks to Arden Warner for providing some of this information. Arden is here today, so thank you, Arden. Uh, basically, this is a 1.2 megawatt beam uh, with variable uh, uh, bunch patterns that can be used for different uh, purposes. Primarily, this is to drive the, uh, the Dune neutron uh, experiment uh, that, that's, that's being uh, constructed at Fermilab and also uh, uh, north in uh, Minnesota at the neutri neutrino detector. So uh, basically um, this system is uh, constructed with a, a warm section and uh, a cryogenic section taking the energy up to 800 MeV and then they inject into their, into their, booster, into their booster ring. So there's again a hierarchical system. There's four uh, layers of uh, systems that are, are uh, used to have the MPS function. Uh, basically looking at differences in uh, the upstream in the uh, low energy section uh, in terms of current and charge. So these, uh, uh, there's pairs of current sensitive devices uh, and which are administratively controlled. Another layer protection is uh, beam loss in uh, again, in the upstream sections in the, in the MEBIT. The third level is basically readiness signals that come from different systems in the, in the machine. And then finally, uh, depending upon how they want to configure their uh, machine, uh, there's certain uh, permits that are uh, put in place. Uh, for example, if, if they're running the uh, main injector, might be one uh, case versus a beam to uh, the target for, for Dune, might be a different case. Now, moving on to uh, MPS at the SNS. The SNS is also a very high energy, well, high power proton beam. Uh, specifically, it's meant, the beam is meant to hit something. Of course, it's the uh, mercury target uh, that generates the neutrons for users. Uh, and of course, uh, there's many hazards posed by this system, uh, not just the power of the beam, but also the radiation. And uh, having systems live reliably uh, in this uh, environment is uh, challenging. So basically, the, uh, there's an accelerator improvement plan underway uh, at the, uh, uh, at SNS to uh, bring, to modernize their machine protection system, which they call a, a, a fast, uh, fast protection system. 
And they're moving basically to, they, their MPS system has gone through a number of changes over the last uh, uh, 15 or so years. So they're trying to bring their system up into a more uh, modernized system with uh, components taken from sort of more or less off the shelf and allow them to be a, um, basically that they can replace their uh, obsolete hardware with uh, hardware that's uh, more readily accessible and, and easily, more easily replaced. So again, this is a, a very high power machine. It, it's not a, necessarily a low emittance ring, but it does go into a storage ring uh, prior to uh, the extraction of the uh, proton charge onto the, uh, onto the target. Again, uh, so some of the hardware that's being uh, replaced is shown here, this fast protection system, but you can see some of the legacy uh, uh, components. Uh, they still use uh, DG535s. We use, we have a ton of them at uh, Argonne uh, at APS, and, and, but they're in the process of being replaced, these, uh, these delayed timers. Uh, so that's just one of the components that uh, needs to be uh, updated and replaced. And again, I also want to thank uh, Alan Justice for providing some of this data. So let me move on to uh, protection for APSU uh, chambers and, and collimators. We basically, for our system, we'd like to uh, vertically spread the beam on the collimators. There's five collimators that are in what's called the, uh, well, zone F is where our RF systems are. And uh, we have five sets of collimators in that region. Uh, Tracking simulations have shown that we can stop the beam in these five collimators, uh, but what we have to do is we have to be able to reduce the energy density. So in order to do that, we want to use a fan out kicker to spread out the beam uh, vertically on the collimator uh, prior to uh, it striking. So uh, we've looked at some of the uh, power levels that are necessary above, we have to run it above 30 milliamps. We, we'll need to use this uh, abort kicker scheme, this swap, this uh, fan out kicker. Um, one possibility is uh, we'd like to get, make the machine self-protecting if it's possible. Uh, it's not clear that that is possible, but one of the things we want to look at is whether we could use wake fields in our collimator somehow to disrupt the beam prior to uh, actually striking it or uh, striking something that we don't want it to. Uh, can we incorporate that into a collimator structure? Well, it's not clear. If all else fails, we could do as others do and build a dedicated dump line. That's unlikely for APSU because things are so tight. But if we need to, uh, to do that, then that's something we have to do to run the machine because it is a user facility and we need to make our users happy. Okay, uh, so we've taken, undertaken a, an effort to try and understand uh, what, what the material uh, behavior is when we strike a target with our, with our beam. So uh, initially, uh, I, I started doing some simulations with loss distributions that uh, were provided by Elegant uh, and using the Mars code. Uh, to look at dose in different uh, materials. And what we found is that uh, the temperature rise that we would uh, calculate uh, based on the dose in, in our collimator material was actually quite high. Oops, pardon me. The, these temperatures uh, in aluminum uh, were well above the melting temperature in aluminum, titanium, copper, and, and certainly in tungsten. So the Static simulations that you get from your normal matter, particle matter interaction programs would suggest that, uh, that tungsten, of course, is the best uh, material to use. Now, uh, that would be true, uh, except that uh, whereas aluminum might melt, uh, uh, tungsten might explode. So you don't really want to use that kind, you don't want to have that kind of a uh, situation going on in your machine. It's not, not, a good thing to, not a good thing to do. So we were, we, we wanted to verify that, in fact, this was uh, the case. So uh, we did some experiments. We, did, we ran two experiments in the APS storage ring trying to approach APSU conditions. 
that we expected on our collimator materials. The first, in our first experiment, uh, we, in May of 2019, we, tr we used both aluminum and titanium alloys. Uh, and I'm showing here is uh, photography uh, on the uh, titanium. Uh, unfortunately, because we ran these things, we have to, at the beginning, run our, our experiments at the beginning of our run cycle because we're running for users. So um, during our maintenance period, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, the vacuum group had replaced the bellows and uh, it had knocked out a, an RF gasket and we were unable to uh, store beam in our storage ring for about 12 hours. So that cut down our study time uh, to the point where uh, we could only get up to a 67 milliamp. So it turns out we had to uh, steer around this obstruction uh, to the point where we were got enough synchrotron radiation that we could finally burn it out and get beam stored in the machine. But we got enough beam that we could certainly see damage in a, a material like tungsten. I'm sorry, uh, titanium. Uh, there was also damage in aluminum, but not nearly as badly. And that's probably because the, uh, the, the you know, the radiation length with, in titanium is, is significantly shorter, two and a half times shorter than in uh, aluminum. So we still wanted to try and get up to a full current, which is uh, 200 milliamps, uh, we expect for APSU. Uh, so in, finally in 2020, January 2020, we were able to conduct the experiment up to uh, full 200 milliamps. Uh, we actually had to reduce the number of bunches, well, I'm sorry, we had to increase the number of uh, bunches in our machine. Our harmonic number is 1296. Uh, in order to reduce the wake field heating, we actually had to run with seven, 972 bunches. That's three of every four buckets filled with charge. So, and, and doing so, um, and, uh, shown here over on the, on the right, uh, is uh, our aluminum, one of our aluminum targets. Uh, as we increase the current from so 18, we didn't see anything at 18 milliamps, but it, we started to see uh, damage at uh, 34, mil, roughly 35 milliamps, and then as we went up in current, uh, damage got very severe. These are all single strike events on the uh, aluminum target. Uh, we had thought that separating these by 400 microns, four tenths of a millimeter would be enough to uh, distinguish each one of the strike uh, positions. Uh, that was true at the low current, but it really wasn't true at the higher currents. As we went up to uh, 200, these, these, uh, these marks got pretty uh, broad and uh, began to overlap. These last two at 200 were, were clearly uh, interfering with, well, basically uh, melted material was overlapping with the, within the two cases here. So we can clearly cause damage in, even in a low Z material like, uh, uh, like aluminum. So that, that was a, a big concern. So we began doing some hydrodynamic calculations uh, where we tried to uh, use a code called FLASH. FLASH is a hydrodynamic, actually it's used by uh, astrophysicists to model supernova. Uh, it works primarily, it, it really only considers plasmas. And uh, initially I approached uh, Nikolai Mokov, who was the Mars author about you know, what kind of a hydrodynamics code do we need to, to look at? He suggested I contact a, a, a colleague that he had worked with uh, back in SSC, Super, Super Collider, that was going to be built in Texas, uh, uh, Doug Wilson at Los Alamos, uh, thinking that one of the Los Alamos codes might be useful. But um, uh, Doug Wilson actually suggested we use this code from the University of Chicago called FLASH. So that's what, that's what we're doing here. Uh, and what I'm showing on the right is an animation where uh, taking the dose data that we get from Mars and using that in flash, uh, I'm showing uh, what's called a boundary var, where basically this, this boundary is the release condition. We're using a, a temperature of uh, one and a half TVAP in aluminum. That's the vaporization temperature times 1.5. And that defines basically this line. Now, what I also wanted to see here, the, uh, the, maximum, the maximum temperature that's plotted is 933K, which is the melting temperature of uh, aluminum. So even though we have a relatively small trench, the melted region is much larger. And that's really what we saw in, in some of the experiments. So this 
gives us some, uh, uh, at least gives us a, a sense we're on the right track in terms of, uh, of modeling. But again, that's not, uh, it's a little uh, too clean for what we actually see. In our, th these are two different uh, deposition models. This is actually uh, based on our experiment, experimental data using pinhole camera uh, to give us the transverse size. So in our experiment from uh, 2020, we were, uh, this distribution it comes from, uh, actually comes from elegant as well as the particle, uh, uh, the, the beam size that we got out of uh, elegant and uh, then, then simulate it, I'm sorry, beam sizes from our pinhole camera, then simulate it in Elegant, and then those loss distributions are given to Mars. So this is for the uh, total uh, loss distribution that was, uh, uh, we, we assumed uh, from, based on the data that we had obtained from our experiment. And we were able to get up to about 30 megagray in our experiment, which is, which is quite high. However, in the uh, APSU, uh, this is a, just a simulation of APSU uh, uh, beam loss. This is for a single bunch of a 48 bunch fill pattern. The dose is 3 megagray. Well, if you multiply 3 megagray by 48, you're up to close to 150 megagray. So in fact, we were, we were getting not as close as we thought we were. So, you know, there's a significant, uh, significant amount of uh, damage that, that that can cause. Now it's, it's smaller, of course, same, you know, same amount of charge on the right as on the left, but uh, clearly this is, uh, we, we, need to take, we need to take this uh, very seriously. Uh, even a small hole in a vacuum chamber is not a good thing. So, uh, okay, so. We had initially been modeling this uh, uh, in flash as a uh, uniform distribution, we saw over three turns of uh, 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 three turns of loss uh, during the experiment. But in, in reality, we have uh, uh, we really have a, a, a distribution in, in time. And what I'm showing on the right is the elegant simulation that um, actually uh, model we use to uh, model the uh, the loss. Uh, during the experiment, and this is given to this is now given to Flash uh, to give us a, a better uh, understanding of or a better model uh, in, uh, of the hydrodynamic aspect of this. So what we see uh, there's there's a lot of melting that goes on uh, when we strike the surface uh, with 200 milliamps and. So flash kind of gave us this uh, sharp boundary. Now this boundary again, is, this is the uh, boundary between uh, solid and, and plasma. And flash only models plasmas. It, right now it can't do anything with uh, a, a liquid or a gas. So, uh, but of course we know that we have, we have those states that, that are occurring. Um, what I wanted to do is see at the end of the, the energy deposition, what would happen if we just changed the release from this one and a half TVAP, dropped it down to one TVAP, in other words, reduce the release down to uh, the uh, vaporization temperature. And what we see is we just let it run. Uh, you, you, the white line again represents the, uh, this, this, uh, this boundary var. On, on the other side of the boundary var, it's just solid. After the boundary var, it's, it's considered a plasma. And you can see that it begins to fill in. And it makes, begins to make, instead of a uh, sharp edge, more of a, a soft, pillowy kind of, melty kind of uh, uh, di distribution or a pattern that we actually see on the, um, on the photography of the surface. So this gives us some uh, hope. It's, you know, again, our, Flash guys look at this and say, "This is not right because uh, we, you know, this is. You should be modeling a plasma. We can't model liquids, but this is kind of a heuristic way of trying to get to uh, a path forward where we can uh, begin to t 
take some steps to model what's actually happening on the surface. As far as the diagnostics that we use, uh, at the beginning of each, uh, so we ran two experiments, uh, as I mentioned, one in uh, May of 2019 and the other in, in January of 2020. In both cases, at the beginning of a user run, we, we built up this uh, diagnostic camera uh, to look into the chamber where we had the uh, collimator test pieces. These collimators, so this is a plan view looking basically at beam elevation, slice through beam elevation, with the collimator test pieces mounted at the end of a um, scraper assembly. So, uh, and, and here it's shown uh, fully inserted. So this, we wouldn't run this way. But we, I'm just showing this, uh, this is uh, a, an example of the scraper fully inserted into the chamber. But typically, the, chamber, the, uh, the scraper would be withdrawn to about minus two millimeters, and then we would inject into the storage ring. And at uh, the time we wanted to, once things stabilized, uh, then we would mute the RF and dump the beam. So over here on the left uh, is a, an image of the uh, surface of our aluminum and a titanium. This was the first uh, experiment, so we had titanium and aluminum, and there was a gap between the these two. There's actually two pieces mounted to the end of this scraper body, uh, uh, one above, one below, with a gap in between. And actually, uh, this gap was uh, was important in the sense that we wanted to try and see if wake fields could potentially be uh, affecting the beam as, as the beam flew through it. So this diagnostic was very important as far as providing data uh, during, uh, what we initially wanted to do is see uh, what the damage was uh, when we, uh, after we irradiated each time. Uh, and uh, we had people who thought, you're not gonna see anything. And the beam's not going to do anything to the surface. Well, that turned out not to be the case. It was clearly doing something. As far as the other diagnostics that we use, we use fast beam loss monitors. Typically, those are Trankoff detectors or fiber optic, uh, uh, few silica, high purity fused silica fiber optic links, uh, lengths that we have uh, that uh, feed into a photomultiplier tubes. And also, the turn by turn BPMs were helpful as far as looking at intensities. We could compare the turn-by-turn -turn BPMs with the fast loss monitor intensities, and uh, that was very helpful. So optical images during the beam strike, uh, we could see, and uh, our, we didn't have a very fast system. We were only uh, taking data at 30 frames per second. So there was one frame that had the light, uh, the emission during the, uh, the beam strike. Uh, over, pardon me. On the left-hand side, these are uh, single strikes. This one is at 67 milliamps. Though, though it's low current, it's actually uh, higher charge per bunch. And what's interesting are these, well, at least as far as I'm concerned, what's interesting are these streaks that come off uh, the, the irradiated region. Uh, at 200 milliamps, we were at 7 tenths of a nanocoulomb per bunch. Uh, we're at 2 nanocoulombs here. We were at 7 tenths of a nanocoulomb per bunch, but 972 bunches. Uh, you still see the streaks, but they're much less intense. Of course, the, the beam strike itself, that, that's very intense and, and saturated. We also looked at multiple strikes at the same location, and over here on the right at 200 milliamps, uh, the, in the first case, uh, you see a very bright streak, and on the, after the, at the fifth beam strike, this has diminished quite a bit. We think that this is due to the beam striking uh, farther farther downstream to the, to the left here. So we're just not seeing the, uh, the, the, bright, uh, the, the brightest part of, this, uh, uh, of the beam dump. But this was, this was kind of a bonus. We didn't know what we would see uh, when the beam actually struck the target. So this was uh, very interesting as far as uh, trying to understand what's going on here. So our fast beam loss monitors uh, are very useful as far as looking at, at fast, uh, fast dynamics during beam loss events. It includes injection as well as uh, during beam dumps. So I think I mentioned earlier that we use an abort kicker uh, to protect, if I haven't, we use an abort kicker to protect our superconducting undulators. We found that 
once we installed our superconducting undulators uh, in 2012, 2013, beam dumps caused uh, quenching, which was not a good thing. So uh, uh, effort was undertaken to try and uh, prevent that using an abort kicker to try and direct the beam over to our septum uh, magnet uh, during a beam dump. Uh, and, and what we do is um, once a BPLD trip occurs and the MPS system triggers, uh, there's, uh, the trigger time is right here at 20% on the scope plot. The, after uh, about 80 to 90 microseconds, 85 microseconds of the abort kicker is fired, we find that that spiral time is sufficient to get the beam uh, where we want it to be uh, when we fire the kickers. We want the kickers, again, to fire the beam onto the uh, septum where it can be safely dumped. If, if, we're, if actually our timing is not quite right, we can trip our RF system, and that's not, we, we don't want to do that because the shower will uh, illuminate the fiber, uh, that, that it, the arc detecting fiber for the RF systems and trip the RF system. So it's important that our timing be correct uh, uh, and, and this timing was, was where we found it to be the best. So what's, what's shown here on the left, uh, this is a case where the board kicker fires properly. So there's basically you have a sine wave, half sine wave, uh, as the kicker uh, current rises and then and falls. And uh, this is a, a loss detector in ID1, our first uh, uh, insertion device uh, after our RF systems, uh, a zone F large gap uh, vacuum pipe. And most of the loss is gone here. And, and this is protecting the, there's some loss, but most of it's gone. This protects the SCU, and that's an ID1, and uh, prevents it from quenching. Now, sometimes what happens during a, an, uh, a PSS trip, a personal safety, personal safety system trip, is the, uh, The BPM, I'm sorry, the, the bending magnet power supply is, uh, is, turned, is turned off, and the beam will spiral in. Well, there's no connection between the, uh, the PSS and the MPS. So what happens is the, uh, the, the PSS, pardon me, the, the PSS beam uh, trip will fire early, and MPS will then respond to it later, and that's what you see here. Uh, you get a large loss pattern, and then, and then the MPS uh, firing of the abort kicker. Well, that's, it's okay in the present machine that, you know, if we quench, if we quench the SCU, well, they just have to restart it again. In the APSU, that's not going to fly, because in the APSU, that could cause uh, damage or, uh, well, mechanical damage to a collimator or a vacuum chamber, and that's not going to, and that's not good. So, you know, we're looking for ways to uh, prevent that from happening. Again, just looking at some fast BPM uh, beam loss monitor signals, rather, during the beam dumps. Uh, this was uh, 18 milliamps. This is a 27 bunch fill pattern. There's a, a fast axis here, this, reconstructing the uh, uh, this loss uh, signal. This one long uh, waveform into a, a two dimensional uh, contour plot. Uh, to show the uh, the loss pattern, and then zooming in on a section just so you can see the uh, uh, the loss distribution. This is this, the vertical axis is sort of the slow axis, and the uh, horizontal is a fast axis. That's basically one turn, and uh, zooming that in uh, on the on the lower on the lower plot. Uh, so if we compare uh, the intensity uh, during a a beam dump. During, actually, this was all, all of the beam dumps, uh, looking at this uh, loss monitor. Uh, this is a loss monitor in ID1. And you can see as we increase the current, the, the, the arrival time uh, gets earlier and earlier. And this is due to loading uh, higher current from the cavities, bringing the beam in faster to the, uh, uh, into the wall. And comparing that with uh, elegant, basically, Similar behavior, very similar behavior was modeled with Elegant. So we think uh, this, is, uh, this is a good, uh, a good benchmark uh, for our uh, simulations. 
And then looking at turn-by-turn -turn data uh, during, the, during the, our collimator experiment, basically uh, our turn-by-turn -turn data uh, intensity shown here is, uh, is uh, it's the sum of our BPM signal, but it's, it's on a, a log scale, and so it, it, it's a nonlinear uh, scaling, and it's not as easy to interpret, but basically shows a similar behavior. If we differentiate the, the sum signal, uh, we, we end up with a, uh, the loss intensity over on the right side, and you can see similar behavior to what, we, what I was just showing earlier, uh, where the, uh, uh, the arrival time gets uh, faster as our current increases. So the BPM, uh, these turn-by-turn -turn BPMs are uh, very useful in terms of providing loss locations, but they can't really give us intra-turn losses. So let me summarize. Uh, present high-performance machines, light sources, Linux, require significant care and feeding. We know that uh, APS is a high-performance machine. Well, new machines are going to be even higher performance and even more demanding in terms of maintenance and machine protection. These uh, fourth generation storage and light sources, uh, we must consider the threat from ultra low emittance electron beams causing mechanical damage to high value components like SCUs or the vacuum chamber itself. So simulations that we're undertaking now help uh, guide the effort to protect the machine uh, components exposed to the beam. Uh, and, and diagnostics, of course, are key uh, in terms of MPS and, and necessary for benchmarking codes. So, uh, again, diagnostics are very important. And that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for this tutorial. Um, and in keeping us uh, reminding that even a, a small hole is a bad hole for the <laughs> vacuum, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and for these uh, fourth generation light sources, it became really important. Uh, thanks for this tutorial. So, quest oh, yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> questions. <laughs> I can't see uh, now. Thank you for the excellent overview, Jeffrey. Uh, I have a question and then also a suggestion. The question is, uh, is it possible with the collimation in light of the damage with these small emittance beams to do it in two stages, that you have first a, a thin spoiler and then downstream a, a collimator so that there's less energy deposition in the first stage but the emittance increases so the beam is larger? So in fact, that aluminum acts somewhat like a spoiler. There's only a very small amount of, small fraction of the energy is, is absorbed in the aluminum. Uh, so in some sense, it's already acting like a spoiler. Uh, and with the, right now, the way the design is, we have five collimators. Uh, we, we expect that the beam can be stopped. That's the first thing the beam will see as it spirals in are these collimators. So by the fifth collimator, the beam will be stopped. Uh, the problem is what happens to that first collimator? where the beam actually strikes first. So it's, in some sense, we are doing that uh, with, with this aluminum. But it's possible that we could also uh, use different materials, molybdenum and graphite or uh, uh, fiber, fibrous uh, carbon is maybe another alternative uh, as a, a low-Z material, for, as a spoiler, perhaps. Okay. And then my suggestion was, the uh, flash hydrodynamics simulations are very useful. So I'm thinking, would it be possible to make a shared library of these simulations so the community could do similar um, simulations where they vary it slightly for their own geometry? Rather than having to reinvent the wheel, this kind of uh, conference is a good place to start such a collaborative effort. Thanks. Uh, actually, we, we have been funded to, to do just that. We've been funded to combine Flash, Mars, and, and Elegant. Uh, the particle matter interaction program uh, we're presently using is Mars. It's possible we might also use Fluca. Uh, but uh, we are trying to come up with a package 
uh, where we combine the, the three codes that would be available. And uh, we've, just, uh, we've just got an award to do that. Great. So. Thank you. We still have time for questions. Um, yeah, so I have a question concerning uh, the uh, abort kicker system you mentioned. Um, I would be interested to understand the concept from a PS behind. Uh, so are you using uh, strip line kickers uh, for, uh, which are capable to operate on bunch by bunch or uh, is it a shaker magnet or and uh, by which pulses you are driving, a sinusoidal or half wave or it's a, a rectangular pulse? Uh, basically it's a, a sine wave. It's just a sine wave over uh, 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 a period. So we see multiple, uh, depending upon the bunch pattern, right, we'll see the, we can see uh, the beginning and the end of that bunch pattern at different, loss loca different locations. So it's, it's right now it's just a, uh, it's just a sine wave uh, with a, a time period on the order of a, of a turn. Okay, thank you. The, uh, we plan to have a swap out kicker to do slow aborts. I'm sorry I didn't mention that, but uh, one of the MPS uh, decisions that it makes is whether we can do a slow abort where what we do is we swap out um, one bunch at a time uh, where we have a, uh, a kicker uh, which will blow up the beam and then we dump it. Uh, so that's, that's a relatively long process, but if we can control the beam dump, we can, we can, do, a slow, we can do a slow beam abort. And that's, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're working on how to do that. Of course, we can't always do a slow beam abort. Sometimes the uh, a power supply fails and off you go into, uh, into a, a collimator very quickly. Okay, some more. O over there in the middle. Hey, thanks for the nice talk. I have maybe a very naive question. So, what about vacuum uh, around the collimator? So, especially in the worst case scenario where you actually melt your collimator, how, how do you cope with this? Well, that's a bad situation. If we're, you know, we're melting the collimator, we get a, a, a big volt, we, we get a big vacuum spike. Uh, where, this, where the experiment was done, it uh, was in a straight section, a sector 37 straight section, and just upstream, uh, about two meters upstream, is the fourth cavity of, uh, uh, of the sector 37 uh, uh, RF cavities. So uh, we, we saw, uh, with our cold cathode gauges, we saw significant vacuum spikes uh, when, the beam, when the beam struck. Um, so, we, from our colleagues at uh, LHC, we were given uh, some molybdenum uh, graphite to actually make into a uh, collimator test piece, uh, but uh, there was some concern uh, because there was carbon, so carbon flakes associated with that, and it was close to the, this, one of these uh, cavities that we, they didn't really want to, they didn't want to put that into the machine, unfortunately. So we couldn't test the molybdenum graphite uh, because we were afraid of contamination of, uh, of uh, carbon in, in, the, uh, in the cavity. So that, you know, it, cleanliness is clearly an issue that we worry about. Okay. Thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, naive question, I never really work on, on light sources, but um, you know, my impression is that clearly a light source is fully optimized in terms of components you know, to deliver uh, X-rays as much as you can. So now if you really have to implement you know, collimators, so collimation sections, kickers, deletion kickers, what, what would actually be the impact on, on those machines? Would you have to make your machine much you know, bigger, basically? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Presumably, uh, we'll come up with schemes that allow uh, uh, the light sources to function. So, uh, ESRF EBS is functioning now, as far as I know, uh, with an ultra bright, uh, low emittance beam. 
not quite as low emittance as APSU is planning. Uh, we hope to have a, a 42 picometer uh, emittance. I think uh, EBS is, is higher than that. And uh, in the brightness mode uh, for APSU, we're actually down to 30 picometers. So that's actually the most challenging uh, in terms of the dose, in terms of uh, uh, peak dose. So um, yeah, these, these machines are just coming online. Now, uh, LCLS has been running for a while. Um, uh, LCLS 2 will have challenges and, uh, but uh, again, there are uh, fast machine, there's machine protection that uh, can hopefully protect uh, critical components uh, in, that, in these light sources. So that's, that's what we're working to, towards. Okay, so I can't see any raising hands, but there were a lot of questions, so you can skip your quiz, Mew. <laughs> okay, thanks again, Jeff, for this. Okay. So, Okay, so just a minute with the technical issues. Meanwhile, I can uh, introduce uh, Eva. Um, Eva Giraldo um, studied um, t um, telecom engineering in Barcelona at the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. She made her master thesis on magnetoresistive materials and its application to contactless potentiometers. In 2000, she started working at CERN initially as a technical student. After that, uh, she joined the LHC beam position monitoring team. And she told me that was really an amazing period of her career. However, she decided it was time to move to something different. And she joined the controls group for about one year and a half. Um, but luckily for us, uh, she returned to the beam instrumentation group uh, in, in 2017 to work on beam loss monitoring systems, especially on diamond beam loss monitor systems, which, we'll hear, uh, which we will hear about in a minute. Um, beside her family, she enjoys traveling water sports such as diving, rafting, and kayak. If time allows, she likes reading, especially fantasy and science fiction. So uh, if I guess uh, your talk now contains not fiction but real data. <laughs> so please go ahead. Oh, no? So once again, we need some technical help. Doesn't work. Okay, let's continue with the normal microphone. And now, now it works. No. Okay, but now it's just stick <laughs> in my head. There is echo. There's a little bit of echo, I think, but okay. Let's try to move forward. So uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And thank you very much uh, to the scientific committee to give me the opportunity to present uh, here in this conference the BLM Diamond System at LHC and SPS. Uh, maybe by my voice, you know, I'm, I'm, a bit, uh, I'm a bit stressed. It burates a little bit, but uh, we'll try to move forward. So. Um, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to uh, introduce the diamonds uh, detectors principle, and I'm going to show you also where they are installed in the SPS and LHC. Uh, I'm going to present you also the new hardware platform that we use for the readout of these detectors since 2018, and uh, try to very briefly show you the, the, main, the main blocks of the, of the firmware uh, implemented of the FPGA to make this readout, because this helps, I think, to understand how we build up or how, how the acquisition modes that we use are, are implemented. I will present a use case, and then I will finalize with uh, the conclusions. So the working principle of the diamond detectors, in fact, is, is uh, simple to understand, I think. Uh, you can think of them like a solid-state ionization chamber. So we have, um, 
where it is. We have just uh, uh, the, diamond, the diamond crystal where we put uh, uh, an electrode in each of the larger surfaces. And, uh, oops, <laughs> okay, it still happen. Um, and then one of the electrodes is connected to a DC bias voltage, and the other electrode we connect the, the, acquisition, the acquisition chain to read the signals. So when one charged particle traverses uh, this, uh, this material, it ionizes the atoms of the diamond, and then it generates uh, electron hole pairs. And because of the presence of this electric field produced by the, by the bias voltage, then this, uh, this um, charge carriers drift towards the positive and, and negative uh, electrodes, inducing a current that is the one that we want to measure and the one that is proportional to the energy deposited in the material. So uh, our detectors um, are, are provided by, by CBTEC uh, instrumentation and they, they look like, uh, like, uh, like this photo. They are um, crystals, poly, polycrystalline um, diamonds uh, of 10 by 10 millimeters and 0.5 millimeters thick. So, Diamond is a material that has very interesting properties to build these kind of detectors because, in fact, uh, this material uh, can produce uh, very fast response times in the order of just a few nanoseconds. In LHC and SPS, we have bunch spacings that are 25 nanoseconds. So, for us, this allows us to do bunch, 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 bunch by bunch loss measurements. Also, it's a material that has very high resistivity, what makes that it has very little dark current, only on the order of, of picoamps. And in addition, it's a very uh, radiation resistant material that obviously for a beamless monitor is, uh, is a fundamental uh, property. Um, besides to that, is it has negligible uh, temperature dependence, a very high dynamic range, and, and it's small, so it's easy to integrate in, in many places in the machine. So this is a scheme of, of the LHC and SPS. You probably have seen it uh, thousands, thousands of times. Um, and the green dots show where these, uh, where these diamond detectors are located. So both machines, uh, LHC has uh, near 4,000 ionization chambers, and SPS has 450 uh, ionization chambers. And ionization chambers are still uh, the main protection system uh, of, those, of those machines, and they are also used for optimizing uh, the machine operations. Diamonds are used a bit different. They are not connected to the, to the beam interlock system. They are just used to analyze injections and extraction events because they are the, the losses can, can be very, very fast. And they are also used to um, perform losses studies where the fast response of these detectors um, give additional information to the, to the ionization chambers and are of main importance. So <clears throat> here in the, in the SPS, we have one detector in the, in the injection. Uh, to SPS, we have two in, in the slow uh, extraction line to our experimental facility, and then uh, we have uh, two transfer lines from SPS to LHC, one transfer line that injects beam one, and another transfer line that injects beam two. And we have, again, one detector uh, in the extraction uh, region of the SPS and two in the beam one injection, and similarly for the other, for the other side. In addition to that, we have two, uh, one per beam on the damp uh, extraction lines, and we have three per beam in the beta cleaning region. And those, in fact, are the ones that are attracting uh, most of the attention of our users because they see losses during the full beam cycle, and then they could do very interesting studies with them. So, CERI is using these detectors since many years, about 2010. And uh, till recently, they have always been acquired for many years within uh, fast oscilloscopes and also CBTEC uh, ROSI DAC systems. But in 2018, uh, the readout electronics has been uh, migrated, has been uh, changed, and the software has also all uh, be, uh, been uh, rebuilt or uh, refurbished. So now the readout is done with, uh, with the standard SER uh, beam instrumentation um, FMC carrier card, because this is a card that uh, is also used by many other beam instrumentation devices, by uh, BLMs and BPMs in, in different machines, uh, fast current transformers, etc. So it facilitates the maintenance on the integration of these systems, and also the software has uh, completely adapted to the new to the new electronics, and is now uh, much uh, better integrated with different uh, control layers at CERN for uh, logging all the measurements, publishing the data, etc. 
Um, this migration has also provided us certain, um, has uh, increased the flexibility that we have with the signal processing. So now we can adapt to the, to the user requirements a bit faster. We have incremented the number of acquisition modes. I'm going to present them a bit later. And additional features also like uh, making an internal auto pattern, uh, auto triggering based on, on, on data pattern recognition or make a capture only on selection, on a selection of bunches. It has also increased the number of ADC bits, so from eight with the oscilloscopes and, and the previous systems. Uh, now we have 14 bits, and uh, it has always a counterpart, so now we have reduced uh, significantly the sampling speed. So from giga samples that we had before, now we have 650 mega samples per second, and the input range has also been reduced from uh, several uh, volts to uh, plus minus 0.45 uh, volts. So this is how it looks, how the system is installed in the machine. So uh, typically we have uh, some kind of support near a, a collimator or another element that produces um, high loss rates. And then in this support, uh, we um, uh, fix a series of components. So basically the diamond detector and AC-DC splitter with several AC couplet outputs. Uh, and then in each of these uh, AC couplet outputs, we apply a different gain amplifier or in some cases, losses are so high that we need even to attenuate the signal by different, by different attenuations. So all this part is sitting in the tunnel and then we have hundreds of uh, meters of cable till we reach the auxiliary galleries where basically we have a, a BME crate with a CPU and several of these, of these acquisition cards that I have just mentioned and obviously the power supply. Um, so this is the card that I have, uh, that I have mentioned. So it's a, it's a still a BME uh, base. It, uh, it has two um, memory integrated uh, circuits of one gigabyte each and an ARIA 5 FPGA. And it has several uh, SFP uh, sockets for SFP transceivers where one is dedicated to the beam synchronous timing. And this is very important for this system, in fact. And then it can be equipped with any kind of uh, mezzanine card that follows the standard called FMC. And we have a commercial card, in fact, that is called FMC 1000 that is equipped with a one ADC that has 14 bits, two channels, and can sample up to 1.25 gigasamples per second. And likely, because of, uh, of the limitations in the transceivers of, of the ARIA 5 PGA, we can only operate it at 650 megasamples per second, but for the moment, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has been enough. So, okay, don't be afraid. <laughs> Gonna try just to show, um, really not entering into the details of the firmware, but just to show the main, uh, the main ideas because I think it can, it can, it can be useful. So, uh, first of all, we have this FMC car with the two channels of the ADC that are sampling 650 mega samples per second, as I have said, asynchronously to, to the beam. And then this data, it is sent through very high speed uh, serial links towards the, towards the FPGA. And okay, this data, it is received, the code sort, basically prepared for the later post-processing. And the post-processing is the most important part. Uh, and I'm gonna explain it later. And one of the main uh, characteristics is that it receives the bunch clock and the tar clock of the machines. And these star clocks, the first thing that we need to do is synchronize them with the ADC frame clock. Because this way, we can uh, tag every single sample of the ADC to which bunch it belongs to and to which turn it belongs to. And this helps a lot in the processing later on. So we have a little uh, block of logic that just compensates the lace of the cables, uh, latencies of the ADCs, etc. And then from that point, I, I'm a bit... Uh, Oops, here. And then from that point, we have all the samples that we know to which bunch and which star it belongs. So we can integrate all the samples that belong to the same bunch. And then we can this way have the bunch loss integrals. Unfortunately, uh, life is not ideal. So we have uh, our signals have certain baselines that are not negligible. And in addition, the signal of every uh, bunch has a very long decay tail that sometimes overlaps with the signal of the following bunch. So to correct the integrals and try to mitigate a little bit this error, we have this little block that tries to esti estimate bunch per bunch these baselines so that we can correct uh, these bunch loss integrals. After that, uh, we have a little block that we can enable if we wish, that what it does is it just suppresses all the uh, bunch loss integrals that are below a, a certain threshold and that are basically due to noise or, or similar things. And this is what, uh, what we can, uh, what we can uh, then uh, record in our buffers. 
And obviously, we can then sum all the bunch loss integrals that happen during the same turn so that we can have also tor loss integrals. So, with this kind of processing, we have implemented two types of measurements. So, one that is single shot, that is using all the detectors, and one and five that are continuous modes that are used particularly on those detectors that don't see a single pass, that, that we see the, 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 the losses during, uh, during long periods of time. So, those of the beta ground cleaning region. So, for what regards the single shot, it consists uh, simply in, uh, in dumping the ADC raw data in these two, uh, in two circular buffers. We use one pair per channel. And, uh, and these, um, these uh, circular buffers are freeze with some kind of signal. And this uh, freezing mechanism, mechanism is also very flexible. We can use front panel signals. We can use beam synchronous, beam synchronous uh, events coming from this synchronous timing network. Or we can use this uh, auto pattern, auto triggering pattern recognition. So we can define a series of criteria to decide when the data is interesting. And we can freeze it So for later post-processing. And I'm putting here just a simple, uh, a few examples. There are, there are more. Where, for instance, we can say, I want to freeze the signal if n bunch loss integrals are above a certain threshold within one turn. Or we can define a, a different kind of criteria. I want to define three windows with a certain threshold. And then if the losses in the middle window are above the threshold and in the adjacent windows are below, then this seems an interesting event that needs to freeze the buffers, record the data, and send it to the login uh, measurement databases. For what regards the continuous measurements, I'm going to present just two of them because I think uh, time is limited and, and I think are the most often used. So one is the uh, beam loss arrival time histogram. So that one, it consists in taking an LHD term that is 89 microseconds, and then we divide this term in very small bins, periods of time that corresponds to the sampling period, in fact, so 1.54 nanoseconds. And then we build an histogram that cones up here, okay, that counts uh, how many times in a period of time the rising edge of the signal has crossed a certain threshold. So we build like that uh, uh, an histogram that I'm, presenting, uh, that I'm presenting here. And just for comparison, I have put here the bunch by bunch intensity from a fast current transformer. So at first view, if you look, it may seem uh, it's not exactly the same filling scheme. But in fact, it's just a question of the, of the very thin granularity that we have on the left plot. Because if we take a zoom, then we can see that we re really see in the losses of, uh, of every single train of bunches. And we can still continue making the zoom and see the bunch loss, the losses of every single bunch. These modes use a, a, a counting mode, so the users wanted to have a similar mode, but where the, the measurements are really proportional of the, of the beam losses. So this mode was implemented. We call it a beam loss integral, bunch by bunch losses. I have already explained mostly how it is, uh, how it is um, calculated in the, in the FPGA. So what we do is we integrate the loss magnitudes uh, that happen within a bunch of slot using some kind of baseline uh, correction. And then we accumulate these bunch loss integrals for a certain amount of time that typically is about one second. And with this, we can build this kind of, uh, this kind of plot. So in horizontal, I have the, the bunch of slots. And in vertical, I have, I have time. And then we can see the different uh, injections of all the bunches and, uh, and okay, the losses during the energy ramp, uh, the stable beams, etc. We can decide to follow the losses of some particular bunches only while the operators are doing some kind of, uh, of uh, optimization of the machine. For instance, they are changing the turn, they are changing the, the, the crossing angle or similar things. I have just as an example put, uh, put here um, the bunch losses of, of five of the bunches, uh, not with two changes, but in that case, what I put was the, the, the intensity to see how the, how the different bunches were, were injected and, and the energy to see that most of the losses were happening, in fact, during, during the uh, energy ramp. Or we can decide in a certain instance to look to the, to the profile, to the losses of all the, of all the bunches and trains. And this, in fact, is very useful for, for uh, different users and, and, and scientists because looking into the, the pattern of this kind of, uh, of losses, they can um, know whether the dominant loss cause is electron cloud effects, like for instance, when they have a shape like that, or when, whether it's a long range beam beam effects. Um, so I don't have much time to explain many use cases. I had to remove many slides, so I have 
left one that I think is a is a um, interesting case because it's not the typical measurement that one would think to, to use BLMs for that. So in that case, it was used the two BLM diamonds that are installed in this SPS uh, slow extraction line uh, where the beam is extracted and bunched. And then the, the operators wanted to know what, how much was the remaining SPS RF component. And for that, in fact, they used the, the BLM diamonds. So this uh, particular installation is, is a bit noisy, we need to address it, but by doing several acquisitions on different extractions with and without beam and, and making the FFTs and, and some averaging, they were, uh, it was possible to see the, the, the component, the SPS uh, RF component that was around 200.4 uh, megahertz. There were certain interferences that didn't, were not produced by the beam, so that's why the two scenarios were needed to, to, to be uh, measured so that we can, uh, we can uh, subtract and disentangle them. Um, so the SPS RF component was, uh, was visible and was monitored during, uh, while the operators were changing different parameters to reduce the RF component, because in that case they didn't want it. And by doing many acquisitions along the, the cycle, that is uh, about five seconds, then they can also see the evolution of this RF component uh, along the cycle. <coughs> okay. So finally, to conclude, the LHC and SPS BLM diamond acquisition system has been migrated uh, from these uh, fast oscilloscopes and, and uh, DAC systems to FMC digitizers equipped in, uh, in, a, in a standard Serbimi uh, FMC carrier. The new platform has allowed to uh, integrate new acquisition modes. I have presented some of them and also new trigger mechanisms. And it has facilitated the software development and integration with the rest of uh, uh, software control layers. The new system provides a larger number of bits, but uh, it has some counterparts. So it, the, the, the input range uh, uh, is uh, much uh, smaller, but has required that we duplicate uh, the number of channels to overlap uh, two different uh, dynamic ranges and to extend this way the dynamic range of the system. And it's being considering uh, in the future maybe to update these front, front ends to have uh, remotely controllable, uh, controllable gains. And the system is being commissioning, uh, being commissioned after the LEC long shook down and it will be continue uh, being uh, further characterized and optimized in the, in the months to come. Thank you very much. <laughs> One minute left. Well, thanks a lot, Eva, and keeping the time. Perfect. Um, yeah, it's nice to see that these fast monitors provide really a large uh, flexibility. Yeah? So you have different modes to, to analyze mm -hmm. the beam. That's great. So, oh, no, come on. Questions? There is in the middle. Oh, hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, are you using polycrystalline diamond for this? Yes. Have you considered using single crystal to try and improve the time response? Uh, I think it's mostly a question. We use single crystalline diamond detectors in another kind of detector that is inside the cryostat of the magnets. Uh, for, uh, for those kind of detectors, I think uh, it's mostly uh, well, a question of price first and also for uh, making this kind of, uh, of time uh, measurements, uh, the polycrystalline seems to be uh, enough. They, they are not uh, complaining. So. Okay, and if I can ask a second question. So is, the, is it you getting consistent results between different polycrystalline detectors? Okay, it's a very interesting question and difficult for me to, to, to answer. In fact, I don't know if you have seen, but most of the, most of the figures, they were do, uh, shown uh, raw data of the ADC. So we don't have an absolute calibration of these diamond detectors. And I have uh, sometimes talked with the different users and they are uh, mostly interested in looking into, into the waveforms. So different detectors have different length of cables. They have uh, different gains, uh, different attenuators. Uh, losses are also very difficult. Calibrating them is is not an easy process. So we are going uh, through, through this uh, process. We have a doctoral student that is working on that. So for the time being, it's very difficult to compare in absolute terms one detector toward, towards another one. So it's mostly see the, the, the waveform of the signals and know whether it's a bunch beam, bunch beam, higher than usual, uh, happening during, uh, on the flat top of the kickers or happening uh, 
<laughs> in another moment, so it's more for synchronization uh, uh, things and, and okay. this Cheers. Thank you for that. Okay, another question. Well, since the question of polycrystalline versus single crystal uh, diamonds came up, uh, we did some studies and found that there is a long decay tail on po polycrystalline material. Uh, depending on the quality of the polycrystalline material, it can go from uh, seconds to even um, seconds. hours. Uh, okay. It's very slow uh, if it builds up. It, it, there are charge traps in the, in the, yes. in the interfaces. Mm -hmm. The single crystal material is extremely quick, and, very, and it, we uh, ended up adopting that as, as our uh, preferred solution. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for this command. Okay, I can't see. If I, if I can just uh. comment on this last, uh, Aran, I think at CERN, uh, some of the detectors that are used in, the, in our BLM sections, there is uh, in literature, there are te documentation testing the speed, uh, at least the compatibility with the bunch per bunch in the LAC. It was proven for in the laboratory with the radioactive sources and so on. Now, uh, I think, that, yeah, it, it, there are some references for this. So they are suitable at least for the uses that, uh, for, for the LAC speed. For LAC and SPS, yes, they can uh, disentangle the SPS RF. Uh, components, see all the oscillations and bunches. That was some other question. A quick question. Is the FMC carrier card down in the tunnel next to the device or is it all remote? It's in the tunnel, but it's not uh, next to the beam. It's in the auxiliary galleries. So that's why we have uh, about 250 meters of, of cables. And the FPGA is upstairs? Or no, also. it's also down in the tunnel, but in the galleries, where the gallery. radiation is much less, uh, is much less uh, important, and the system can, so can withstand. How far away is the gallery? How long is that cable? So the cable is about 200, uh, 250 meters. Uh, oh. It depends, uh, it depends of, the, of the different locations of the detectors. Yeah. Uh, the gallery, uh, well, there is a, a big uh, concrete wall in between the tunnel and the gallery, in fact. So the gallery is just uh, on the other side of, of, this, uh, of this tunnel. And then the detector is uh, somewhere further downstream in, in the tunnel. Okay. So the galleries are not all the circumference, are just in, in some sections, in fact. Yeah, thank you. So, thanks a lot again, Eva, for this Thank you talk. So, during preparing the next speaker, I will introduce him. Um, Alan Fisher, well known in the community. So Alan grew up in Toronto, Canada. He moved to Cambridge, uh, uh, Massachusetts, when he, uh, where he received his bachelor and its uh, PhD already in, in 1983. Afterwards, he moved to electoral engineering department in Stanford as a research associate working with infrared free electron lasers. After this introduction to, to accelerator and FELs, he moved in 89 to the accelerator test facility at Brookhaven National Lab to work on photocathode laser systems, FELs, and inverse FELs. In 94, he moved back to Stanford to join SLAC as head of diagnostics for the new PEP2 collider. Now he's working on diagnostics for LCLS and LCLS2 X-ray FELs and FACET and FACET2 test facilities. Ellen also likes uh, very much hiking, and recently he returned from a hiking tour in several national parks in Utah. And probably uh, he was also hiking in Middle Earth. Actually, I've seen pictures of hoodoos and goblins, and I think he missed the orcs, luckily, so uh, he survived. <laughs> so good to see you here, Ellen, to give us a talk about commissioning beam loss monitors uh, for the upgrade of LCLS. Well, thank you. I, I didn't bring my travel photos from Utah, but uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll talk about uh, beam loss monitors instead. Uh, first, uh, this is the, the new LCLS, the superconducting machine. A few years ago, uh, 
I spoke about plan three years ago now with the pandemic. I spoke about plans for adding the beam loss monitoring system to this um, new machine. And now finally, after a long pandemic delay, we're talking about the beginning of commissioning. This, we took out one kilometer of LCL, of uh, copper LINAC to put in the superconducting machine. The middle kilometer of our three is the facet two advanced acceleration test, set, uh, test facility. And the third kilometer is the LCLS copper LINAC, followed by two undulators and the experimental halls. We have just begun commissioning. We've only done the injector area so far. We've gone through about 60 meters of the three kilometers. Uh, so much more to do. Uh, but the commissioning uh, began with, uh, in June, with sending the beam through the first cryo module, uh, cryo module one. That's the first of LINAC section called L0B. We went up to 100 MeV. In October, we hope to be going up to 4 GeV and going through 3.2 kilometers. Uh, commissioning the loss monitors began with that. So now the reason for this, of course, we will have an average power of 120 kilowatts when we get this all going and a maximum rate of one megahertz. Uh, we were concerned that ion pileup from uh, the high losses could blind our usual ionization chambers. And the result is we switched to a new type, two new types of beam loss monitors. The ones we call long beam loss monitors are Cherenkov, use Cherenkov emission in uh, radiation hard quartz optical fibers. That's what I'm going to talk about today. They cover extended regions of up to about 200 meters, uh, depending on the functional zone. So we have one for the injector area or two, two sets. Uh, there are also point beam loss monitors that involve the uh, diamonds that we just heard about, also Civitec diamonds. Uh, we, they're covering expected loss points like collimators and such. Uh, I'll, pre I'll present only the long beam loss monitors because the diamonds are at higher energy. They really haven't seen any beam yet. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the layout, we, here's a 200 meter section of accelerator. The, uh, the hardware is all upstairs. The fiber goes downstairs, goes along the machine, comes back up. The photomultipliers are at the downstream end. Each of these electronics modules is the end of one fiber and the beginning of the next. So here's the photomultiplier from the previous fiber. We have an LED that has a constant modulation at a very low rate uh, to test the beam. We call that a heartbeat or a, a self-check. And it sends light to the photomultiplier. Uh, the photomultiplier is, the signal goes through a, 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 a splitter or filter. The low frequencies are used, are inter, integrate the signal over 500 milliseconds. And that integrated signal is, uh, is used for tripping the beam, turning it off. So there's a threshold and a comparator, all analog for the beam containment system, which protects people and radiation safety devices. It's meant to be very simple in concept, so it's fail-safe, and it shutters the photocathode layer and stops the RF to that first cryo module. So it's a slow recovery if we trip it. Uh, there's also another output going to the machine protection system, which has a faster recovery and can vary the rate or turn the beam off, and that uh, system uh, is meant to go first. There is another use, there's another trip mechanism. If the heartbeat fails, then you can get a beam, a, a beam containment system trip. The high frequency part goes to a waveform digitizer. It's used to localize losses and for other purposes like a detector for wire scanners. So we get multiple uses out of this one fiber installation. Uh, here's the way we've installed it. Here is during construction, we're installing cryo modules here. There is what we call the A-chain fiber. There are two independent shutoff chains. The A-chain fiber is on the wall, about 90 centimeters from the beam at beam height. The B-chain fiber is up on the ceiling, and it is about three meters from the beam, and it's uh, uh, giving us a second view of the loss. Because it's a little further away, the photomultiplier gain is a little higher. Uh, I mentioned this self-check. 
Uh, this is an LED modulated at 0.8 hertz, which is uh, sending weak light to the photomultiplier. That's below any beam rate. It's not going to be uh, seen for any other reason. So there's a digital signal processor that is demodulating that uh, using the technique of an analog or of a digital lock-in amplifier. So it's, it takes very little excitation to see it. Uh, the beam trips if the fiber breaks. The beam trips if the high voltage it fails. Radiation raises the fiber attenuation. Anything at all will, uh, that goes wrong here will trip the beam. Uh, here is the installation uh, for the part we have commissioned so far. There are two, uh, two fibers here. One, okay, there it is. One here along, this is the one, the A chain along the wall. This is the one along the ceiling, and you can see it starts just before the gun and, and goes through this first cryo module. It's about three meters from gun to cryo module, and it goes past the cryo module, and then we start a second fiber, which, come on. And then the second fiber picks up here. There's a bit of overlap, about five meters of over, four meters of overlap, something like that and uh, continues on. Now there is one collimator I'll mention here. It's, a, it's basically an aperture, a protection collimator. It helps remove dark current. There's another collimator removing dark current before the cryo module. And then beyond that, it goes past what we call the laser heater region. Uh, and there's a diagnostic beam line here which picks off beam at 120 hertz maximum to sample the beam uh, it, while we're running at higher rate. And finally, this is the end point of the commissioning. We close the ch this collimator, lock its jaws, and you'll see this come up later. And there's also the diagnostic beam line ending here in a Faraday cup. And that's all we've commissioned so far. Uh, so we do get a response, and we get a good response to, the, to this. So we, here we have uh, 500 bunches. Each bunch has 220 picocoulombs, 80 MeV, so that's 17.6 uh, millijoules per bunch, 500 bunches, that's 8.8 .8 joules. Uh, so what happens, be because we have, uh, because we have a, uh, a, a photomultiplier, which is a current source, a charge source, the charge goes directly onto a capacitor. The capacitor then has an RC decay of 500 milliseconds, that's what you see here. So it's all uh, done analog because we want to be able to see dark current, we want to be able to see any rate whatsoever and trip when the signal level on the capacitor exceeds some threshold. So we calibrate using this step change. And then the baseline, and you see a, a baseline here, you see four different fibers, each with a different baseline. First there's the little modulation here, that's the self-check. You can see a little ripple on that. The, uh, there's an offset from the digitizer that's different for each channel and uh, that's a bit of a problem. The ADC acquires data f uh, for the machine protection system and for the EPIX data uh, analysis that I'm using to get this image. Uh, BCS doesn't use this digitizer and doesn't see this offset. It's not part of the trip. But M MPS will measure the offsets and just subtract them. Uh, but right now you see them. And you also see a dark current that comes largely from the gun. I'll talk a little bit about that because it depends on the setting. So here, is, for example, is we have collimating apertures that are before the cryo module. And you can see, depending on the size of the aperture, 24 millimeters, you get a lot of loss. And no, loss goes downward. It's a photomultiplier tube. It's a negative going signal. And at the 20 millimeter aperture, much less loss and even less with these others. And you can see changing between apertures, you can get big spikes in loss. The focusing solenoid at the gun also makes a difference. High loss with the lower setting of the solenoid. You change the solenoid, you reduce the loss. So we did the measurements I'm going to show you with the minimum dark current conditions. Uh, so here uh, we did three different loss locations after the cryo module. Now here the beam is going from top to bottom, same air arrangement as before except turned around and we steered this corrector to cause loss here. 
and you can see this is the same picture as before. Uh, you can see the th three of the four have very large signals. One of them does not. And the one that does not is the fiber here that ends here. It's the one on the ceiling. And if you get a forward directed loss from the beam, most of the loss is, goes forward because it goes with the direction of the beam, it misses the ceiling fiber. It gets the wall fiber because it's much closer and uh, gets the two downstream fibers. So that makes some degree of sense that we see that. We had another loss location where we had to steer two correctors to get them to hit, to, uh, hit the wall in this region. And uh, this one is different because you see, first of all, the two upstream fibers show nothing. We're past the downstream of them. And these two have very different responses. Talk about that a moment later. There's a third loss position here near that, uh, that diagnostic line. We steer these and we're able to get three different uh, directions, not four, plus or minus y or negative x, and that's all. Uh, now the, uh, the, uh, let me go back one. So here is the negative x limit and you can see that uh, response. Uh, the next slide has the positive y and negative y. And you can see something interest interesting here that steering downward gives a larger signal on the, on the ceiling than steering upward. It's not really directional. It's probably due to local shielding effects we haven't sorted out yet. Uh, here is a, just a plot to sort out the measurements I just showed. So you see three loss locations with the directions we were able to do, plus x. Now uh, plus x is toward the wall, minus x is toward the aisle, and uh, plus y is toward the ceiling. So uh, you can see a very different response at these different locations. And the, uh, that depends on local shielding effects. The loss signal does not seem to be directional, as I mentioned before. And here, one fiber in a pair can compensate for shielding that blocks the other one. So uh, that's the benefit of having two different views. Uh, and we can calibrate using a typical or a lower response just to be on the safe side. So I'm using 75 millijoules, that line, uh, for the typical calibration for the 8.8 joules we lost. Uh, so as an example, you take that number, you, in a, you, if you had a uniform loss of 8.8 .8 joules, not a burst, not a millisecond loss, but spread out over 500 milliseconds, so it's a continuous 17.6 watts, then the integrator has R, an RC decay, which means the earlier pulses have already decayed by the time the later ones come in, and that derates the signal by uh, this factor of 1 minus 1 over E. So you end up with uh, 27 .7, or 2.7 watts millivolts per watt. Uh, it, the machine protection limit for this region is 100 watts. So you scale that, you get 270 millivolts. The beam, beam containment system threshold for this region is one kilowatt. So that would be 2.7 millivolts or 2.7 volts. Uh, the beam, the, uh, the, we haven't measured the response to a thick target yet. A, hitting the beam pipe wall is a relatively thin target. Uh, so you get a different shower. If you hit a, lar a thicker target like a collimator, we probably get a smaller signal. We're going to study that next. So for now we're using a cautious lower threshold until we, not these numbers I've just shown up here, uh, until we get calibrate again at up to 4 GeV. Uh, so we did some trip verification tests to show that this works with the electronics we have and we found we get, no, we get uh, a trip when we're above the threshold, no trip when we're below the threshold, just as, as one would expect. There are some trips that appear to happen slightly below the threshold. That's due to the offset in the readout. I'm reading out with these offsets and it's a little, it's, I can't read exactly what the BCS is seeing. Uh, and 
I mentioned that the MPS is combining the two. We have to trip on the dark current because dark current is just as damaging as any other kind of current. Uh, now I also talked about earlier about seeing a diagnostic waveform from this. This is an example of one where we scraped part of the beam on uh, we have two bunches here. There was a long burst. I'm capturing two bunches. Uh, the photomultiplier tube is at the downstream end of the fiber to get more signal. We found in the past that you get, if you put it at the forward end you get four times more signal. So it compresses the time response but it gives you more signal. So it also means that the time response is going from left to right but the position that's involved goes from right to left because traveling in the fiber the signal travels slower than traveling than the electrons in the beam pipe. So this is bunch number two hitting this, this uh, first the downstream collimator and then the upstream collimator. And uh, they're 38 meters apart and you can see bunch two hitting those two collimators and bunch one hitting those two collimators. Uh, so in, just to conclude, we have uh, demonstrated a strong and robust response to these losses. Uh, it requires acceleration in the first cryo module to see anything below the cryo, before, between the gun and cryo module, I don't see anything on the fibers. The energy is just too low. Uh, we've seen a successful test of the BCS trip response. Uh, we see good coverage with some variation due to a local shielding. And we have the PMT waveform providing a diagnostic signal. Uh, that tells us lost locations. It's also a detector that we're starting to use for wire scanners. Uh, what's coming up next uh, in October, we'll do further tests hitting thick targets, possibly as soon as next week, and then we're going to accelerate to 4GEV and we'll calibrate losses all along the path, get a better uh, measurement with these, and also we'll start on the diamond detectors. Uh, so I thank you for uh, your attention and I thank the organizers for letting me have the time to talk about this. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alan. I'm, I guess there are questions. One, one here. Somehow he's running to. Uh, no, there's one you. here. Uh, may I? Yeah. Thank you, Alan, for a nice talk. Uh, I have a question. What is the effective, effective length of the Cherenkov fiber along the beam line and the um, spatial resolution? Uh, the effective uh, length is uh, dependent, it depends on the functional zone. So we try to cover, for example, LINAC number one, section one with one fiber, LINAC zero, and the, the cryo module with another fiber. Uh, but typically once we get past that it's 200 meters. And the spatial and resolution? The spa oh, the spatial resolution. We just started to measure that. I think we, are, we're, we might be able to do five meters. Five meters. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, we have a little bit of correction I'm trying to do for some of the overshoot and ripple that's on that signal right now which will help us a bit. Okay, thank you. If I can ask a second question. You said you are using a Cherenkov fiber also for wide scanner measurement. And uh, do you plan to use a variable gain for wide scanner measurement? Yes, I put in, I built some uh, variable gain amplifiers that, ha that go from an attenuation of 20 dB to a gain of about 60 dB. And the, uh, the, the attenuation is when we do these uh, calibration tests, we're going to hit the full beam into the wall and there you probably need to attenuate in order to look at these signals. Uh, but to use the wire scanner where of course you're getting very small losses, we will get some gain yeah. from this system. It's, uh, there is a nice chip that has um, uh, gain in dB that's a, a gain to attenuation adjusted by a voltage control. And for MPS application you will work with a fixed gain of a PMT I guess. Uh, just the fixed gain of the PMT. There's a, a, a gain, um, a, a one op amp gain that's, con that's uh, set inside the chassis. Thank you very much.
There was another question. Thanks for the talk, Alan. What energy were you measuring, do you think? Uh, what were the electron energy? Uh, for these measurements, it was 80 MeV. Uh, we'll see a lot more, uh, of course, uh, at, when we get up to 4 Jav. Alan, actually, I have a question. Is it some some uh, simulation code foreseen to for for to help the calibration? We've done some simulations. Uh, Mario Santana and our, our radiation physics group has done some simulations of the Cherenkov pickup, and we've also done some simulations of the diamond. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah. Ciao Alan, thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, maybe I missed it actually at the beginning of your talk. Uh, do you have only one fiber pull over a given distance or do you have actually a several fibers to cover you know, the angular acceptance of the, of the beam showers? We have two fibers uh, at, at each location uh, except in some of the, the, there's a transport line where it's just going over the copper linac and there it's a single fiber, but in all of these regions we have these two, and you can see them in the photograph there, oh, past it. You can see two of them in this photograph, one here on the wall and one here on the ceiling. It's trying to give us a di different angular acceptance, different view. So d did you actually, you know, for, for in terms of implementation, you just put it on the ceilings because it was, you know, it was like a convenient place to be or this was for, you know, like a... It was, it was chosen for the convenience uh, and, and having it out of, there are regions where you just are not allowed to put things and you see the stay clear region here. Uh, we couldn't use this region. We put one here to be as close to the beam as possible and the other, well, we were uh, putting it here to be out of the way of the cables. It's, it's a small tunnel. Okay. Thanks a lot, Alan. Okay, so it seems there are no questions. So, Ellen, thanks again for the talk. Yeah, so uh, keep your stomach quiet for a moment and for the last talk, please. Um, the uh, Jada Petringa is uh, giving our last uh, talk for today, uh, for, for, the, for the morning. Um, Jada is a researcher from uh, LNS uh, INFN okay. from, from uh, Catan, yeah, where she completed her PhD in physics in 2019. She also, uh, in, in 2019, uh, had a grant uh, in the framework of the uh, H2020 program. This project was dedicated to the design and realization of new devices for conventional and laser-driven proton beams. In 2020, she had another grant for young researchers founded by uh, INFN. Um, Giada has uh, eight years of professional experience in the field of Monte Carlo calculations for medical applications to the metry and diagnostics in conventional and laser-driven proton beams. Uh, since uh, 2019, she is an official member of the GN4 code collaboration at CERN, and she organizes more than 10 international GN4 schools. So we are glad that Giada uh, accepted to give a talk about acceleration transport and diagnostics for protons in laser matter interaction. So please. Thank you for the nice introduction. So uh, my presentation is dedicated to the acceleration transport and diagnostics from protons uh, uh, produced by laser matter interaction. So uh, this means that my talk is divided in four parts. Uh, first of all, I will give you some information about the main ingredients that are necessary to accelerate protons by using a high power laser. And then I will show you some interesting solution for the diagnostics and dosimetry of the protons produced in this field. And then 
I will show you an example of a complete beam line that was re realized and now is installed at the Eli beam line that is Elimed, that is uh, dedicated to the transport uh, dosimetry and diagnostics of protons and ions for several applications, including medical applications. So in the end, uh, I pleasure to show you some future perspectives uh, at LNS of INFN in this field. So laser as an accelerator machine. So probably you already know, but uh, today one of the main drawback of the conventional ion acceleration machine is the dimension of the machine that is uh, very huge uh, when you want to accelerate high energy particles. Just to give you some numbers, uh, at CERN we have 27 kilometers in length of acceleration machine to accelerate 6.5 terelectron volt of protons. So uh, one of the main problems related uh, for the acceleration of the charged particles uh, is the limit in the electric field, the breakdown limit, that currently is uh, of the order of 10 uh, megavolt per meter. So uh, um, this is the reason because in the last years uh, was investigated a new technique to realize acceleration machines that are compact and able to accelerate high energy particles. So in this field, uh, it's a very interesting and promising technique, the laser-driven ion acceleration that is based on the using of a high power laser that can interact with a solid target but also a gas or a liquid, and in this case we have a creation of a plasma, so this means that it is a, a gas completely united, and it's, uh, we cannot uh, talk about uh, electric field breakdown limit, because in this case it's, uh, the electric field is uh, higher than 200 gigavolt per meter. So this means that thanks to an high power laser it's possible to accelerate, for example, protons uh, with energy up to 100 MeV in dimension that is of the order of 0 0.1 10 micrometer. <clears throat> So uh, here I reported uh, a very interesting uh, plot in my opinion, oh, sorry, there was a problem, okay. Um, on top uh, of this slide you can see that is reported uh, the focus and intensity of the laser expressed in watt per centimeter square as a function of the years. So you can notice that there is this strange trend because uh, starting to 1916 when it was discovered the laser uh, um, technology, you can see that uh, the intensity of the laser growing up and then we have a sort of plateau. Up to uh, 1989, uh, in this period, you can notice that here is written CPA because uh, starting to see this point uh, was diffused the technique to obtain high power laser through the circuit pulse amplification technique. So uh, this means that uh, starting to this date, we have uh, again a growing up in the intensity of the beams and uh, thanks to uh, this, it uh, was possible to accelerate high energy charged particles. So this uh, technique is very simple. Uh, here I summarize uh, just in this sketch uh, the working principle. You can see that starting to an initial short pulse from a laser, this uh, is transported uh, up to a pair of grating that disperse the uh, length. So in this way, it's possible to have a pulse that is uh, long enough with a low power that can be amplifier. Then you can notice that here we have a couple of power amplifiers and then the uh, pulse change and if we have here an high energy pulse after the amplification and finally a second pair of grating that reverse the first dispersion and recompress the pulse. So in the end here you can see that we have a high power pulse with a short uh, pulse length. Short means that can be also the order of few femtosecond and high power means uh, uh, also the order of 10 petawatt. So um, yeah, uh, I reported, uh, I don't know if I can 
play this, this a movie, uh, where it's possible to see the interaction of the laser with a, in this case with a solid target. You can notice that uh, uh, there are the production of different particles because again we have a creation of a plasma. These uh, uh, particles are in different colors because firstly in the case uh, of the acceleration of the protons we have the emission of the electrons that are, here are in light blue and then in magenta we have the uh, protons uh, and in green the ions. So uh, firstly I want to underline you that uh, uh, it's clear that this emission is in, in two direction forward and backward direction and the divergence of this beam is extremely high. So uh, the acceleration of the protons is possible because uh, in, when uh, the laser interacts with the target we have the, 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 the destruction of the, of the target, the energy is transferred to, to the target and there is this creation of a plasma. The energy firstly is transferred to the electrons, the electrons create an electric field and uh, um, the electrons are accelerated with energy up to MeV and this electric field can accelerate directly the protons. This means that uh, thanks to this the interaction we can have uh, with this source directly high energy protons. But of course this is uh, a source, this means that that uh, we are able to accelerate not only the protons, but also, for example, the electrons, or also the neutrons is, uh, if we use a converter. <coughs> uh, okay. There are two classes of laser that are mainly used for ion acceleration. Um, the firstly, we have high energy CPA system. In this case, we have uh, neodymium glass technology for the laser. This means that these lasers are a low repetition rate uh, with a long pulse duration that is of the order of 100 femtoseconds. And uh, an example of this are Vulcan at RAL facility or Felix at GSA. Uh, another class is the ultra short CPA system. In this case, we have uh, mainly the titanium sapphire technology uh, with high repetition rate. In this case, uh, here is reported 10 Hz as standard, but now there are also laser with kilohertz repetition rate uh, with short uh, pulse duration because in this case is the order of 10 femtoseconds or also uh, lower pulse duration. So an example is Gemini at RAL and Draco in Dresden. So uh, um, experimentally was observed a directly correlation between the intensity of the laser and the characteristics also the protons that are uh, emitted. So uh, here I reported in this graph the maximum energy of the protons as a function of the power of the laser. You can notice that there is a sort of proportional trend between these two quantities, but there is also a correlation that you can notice here in the formula with a pulse length a spot surface on the target. This is the reason because if we give a look to this curve we can notice that there are two different trends for two different pulse duration. In blue we have a long pulse duration that is 300 femtoseconds and in red uh, the short pulse duration that is 30 femtoseconds. Currently, the record on the maximum proton energy that was produced uh, through a high power laser is 100 MeV, and uh, this uh, record was reached at the Vulcan facility and corresponds to the cutoff of the protons emitted. Regarding the electrons, just to give you an information, the record is 7.8 giga electron volt that was reached at the University of Houston. <clears throat> so, um, regarding the protons, uh, here I reported some characteristics of these particles that are emitted in the TNSA regime, because the TNSA, that is the acronym of Target Normal Sheet Acceleration, is one of the techniques uh, that are used to accelerate the protons. So, uh, in this case, uh, you can notice that the characteristics of these particles are uh, um, very particular, because we have, for sure, a short um, 
pulse duration because it's strictly connected to the laser. But we have also an extremely high fluence of the particles, protons or ions in a single shot can be of the order of 10 to 11, 10 to 13 particles per bunch. This means that we have an extremely high current and a very large divergence of the beam and a broad energy spectrum. Just to give you an idea uh, of a real case, yeah, I reported a stack of radiochromic <coughs> film that was acquired at the Daranis facility at the Queen's, Queen <coughs> Queen's University of Belfast. And uh, I want to underline you that uh, uh, this beam is not homogeneous. You can notice that in the central part of the beam we have a different color as respect to the other one because in the central part we have the higher energy of the protons with a lower divergence and in the other part we have lower energy with the higher divergence of the beam. So this means that it's not easy to manage this type of source, this type of particles in this condition. So, but the question is, can be an high power laser competitive for ion acceleration? The response is yes, but we have to enhance the maximum proton energy and flux. We have to reduce the angular beam divergence and improve the beam homogeneity and reduce the ion contamination of the beam because again, we have a source that comes from a plasma condition. This means that can be present also other particles. And it's necessary to develop new technologies and strategies to shoot at high repetition rate. So regarding the technique, the methods adopted to select the beam in energy, yeah, I listed some of these. Uh, you can notice that uh, yeah, we, have, we have firstly uh, a simple example uh, that is uh, the dipole. So we have the laser that interacts with the target, the collimation system, the dipole. And then uh, at a certain angle, we have the biological sample. In this way, it's possible to irradiate the biological sample with a selected energy. So another solution is to use uh, quadruples uh, coupled with the selection system, energy selection system. And this solution was also adopted at uh, Eli Beam Line in the Elimed facility that uh, I will show you later. So in the end, another interesting solution that was recently adopted in Dresden uh, is composed by two different dipoles. In this case, it was observed a very good level of reproducibility shot by shot of the laser and uniformity of the beam. So uh, regarding the diagnostics and dosimetry, the uh, The topic is a bit complex because, again, uh, we have an extremely high intensity beam, uh, um, up to 10 to 11 particles per bunch in 10 nanoseconds, means that we have 10 to 9 gray per second. So this means that the dose rate is extremely high. So currently are adopted two different type of detectors, passive and active detectors with some advantage and disadvantage. Regarding the passive detector, the main advantage is that are not affected by electromagnetic noise because when the laser interacts with the target, there is also the emission of an electromagnetic pulse and uh, um, are not affected, of course, by the dose rate, uh, the high intensity dose rate, and uh, easy to handle, but okay, are not good for high repetition rate laser because are passive detector. Otherwise, if we give a look to the active one, uh, we can notice that it could be affected by the electromagnetic noise because uh, are connected uh, to um, a, re uh, a readout, electronic readout, can be affected by the dose rate, but can provide uh, the real-time uh, information about the characteristics of the beams and also on the dose. So uh, here I reported some of the main detectors, the passive detectors that are adopted in this field. Firstly, you can see that uh, I reported the radiochromic film put in a stack configuration. These detectors uh, can be very use useful if uh, are calibrated because can provide an information about no, the dose and also about the energy spectra throughout the convolution procedure as uh, reported here. So other detectors are CR39, a passive detector can provide an information about the flux of the particles and again if uh, are calibrated also about the energy spectra. And in the end we have the image plate. That, thanks to this device it's possible to measure the flux, the energy, but also the beam distribution. 
Regarding the active detectors, uh, IA I reported the three different examples. Firstly, the Thomson parabola spectrometers. In this case, we have both an electric and magnetic field. Uh, and then in this case, is it possible to have an information about uh, not only the fluence of the particles, but also the species? Because uh, the image of the beam that you can obtain is uh, something like that. So you can notice that we have different parabola for different ions. And in this case, it's possible to distinguish the proton from the carbon, for example. So uh, other detectors are the time of flight detectors. In this case, means that we can use a diamond detector, a silicon detector, or silicon carbide detector put uh, in this configuration, that is the time of flight configuration, but uh, it's a little bit different as the standard one. Because in this case, you can see that uh, in this graph, the time zero corresponds to the photo peak. The photo peak is the emission of the photo that can, you can observe when the laser interact with the target. So our starting point it is the laser that interacts with the target and then starting from this we have the component of the electrons, protons and ions and again through the convolution procedure it is possible to know the different contribution and the spectra. So in the end, uh, other devices are the scintillator detectors uh, put in single or also in stack configuration that can provide information about the energy but also the beam uniformity. So uh, here I want to show you the solution that was adopted uh, at Eli Beam Line and the Elimed facility. So uh, Eli Beam, here you can notice that I reported the um, destruction of the building at Eli Beam Line in Czech Republic. Uh, this is one of the three um, main building that was uh, realized with the main um, goal of the, that is the study of the, the different application of the high power laser. So this is the reason because in the structure of the build you can notice that in the ground floor there are four different lasers and in the experimental, for the experimental hall we have six different rooms that are viable for the users. So in the E4, uh, this is one of the experimental hall that was realized uh, especially to study the, um, the protons and the ions emitted uh, through the interaction of a high power laser with the target. Especially in this uh, room, it's possible to use two different types of lasers. We have, in fact, L3 and L4. L3 is uh, one petawatt laser with a short pulse and extremely high repetition rate because 10 Hz for one petawatt is extremely high. And uh, another laser that is L4. In this case, we have 10 petawatt with, with one shot per minute. In both of these cases, we have a short pulse length. So this is the uh, Elimaya uh, beam line that is installed in E4. Elimaya is the acronym of ELI, Multidisciplinary Application for Laser Ion Acceleration. You can see that this beam uh, line is divided in two parts. In the first part, we have the ion acceleration. You can notice in green the path of the two laser, L3 and L4. <clears throat> and here we have the interaction chamber where is put the, the target. And then we have the element beam line that was realized by the um, uh, researcher group from LNS of NFN to select the protons and the ions in energy and also perform diagnostics and dosimetry of the beam online. So uh, this is the picture of the beam, uh, the beam line of the part uh, of Elimed you can see here. So we have firstly the chamber with the laser acceleration and then we have the transport system composed by four permanent uh, quadruples and then the energy selection system, transport and focusing part and in the end the dosimetry and the radiation. Uh, regarding uh, the detectors that now are installed in the beam line, uh, we uh, adopted a different solution for the relative dosimetry and absolute dosimetry. <clears throat> regarding the relative dosimetry, we have uh, two different detectors. Uh, we have uh, a secondary electron monitor that is put uh, in uh, vacuum just uh, before the captain window because uh, uh, the idea is to use this beam line for dosimetric purposes. This means uh, for the irradiation of cells. <coughs> 
and uh, uh, this detector uh, can provide an information about not only the beam fluence uh, but uh, also if it's proper calibrated uh, to the released dose shot by shot. Then we have the multi-gap ionization chamber. This was realized thanks to a collaboration with a company, a detector, <clears throat> and it's a multi-gap ionization chamber. This means that we have two different gaps with two different thickness, five millimeter and 10 millimeter filled with air. So thanks to this configuration, it's possible to um, correct the recombination effect uh, due to the high intensity beams and know the dose released in each shot. So and then for the absolute dosimetry, we realized a Faraday cap. This detector was entirely realized by uh, the researcher group from LNS. And uh, uh, this is a Faraday cap for the dosimetry. So this is the reason because you can see that it's put in, uh, outside the beam line. <clears throat> and uh, the dimension is, is very big because uh, for us it's necessary to have uh, a good uh, um, signal to noise ratio. So this means that the capacitance of the detector is, is very low. So uh, in addition, uh, we, have, um, we have to perform uh, some uh, measure of the, uh, of the field, of the radiation field, because uh, you can see we have to know which is the uh, absolute dose. So in the formulation it's important uh, not only the current and the charge that is collected by the detector, but also the, um, the dimension and uniformity of the beam. So in September 2021, we started the commissioning phase. That the pre-commissioning phase is now is concluded. Uh, this means that in this phase, we installed more than 20 online detectors uh, put in the interaction chambers to know not only the production of the protons and characterize the emission of the protons, but also of the other ions, neutrons, electrons, and also you can see yeah, in, the, in the picture the characteristics of the plasma in terms of temperature and divergence of the beam. So um, just to conclude, I want to show you uh, a recent project that we started in a framework of impulse that uh, is a project founded by the Horizon 2020 and thanks uh, again to a collaboration between the INFN and Eli Beamline. The idea is to realize a new detector that is called PRAG. PRAG is the acronym of so product range measure using silicon carbide to know shot by shot the dose distribution but told but also the energy spectra in a biological sample. So the idea is to realize uh, a detector that is dose rate independent, LAT independent, with a linear response with the dose, extremely high spatial resolution, and able to work online. So this is the sketch of the detector. The prototype was already realized, so, so now we are in the phase uh, of testing. So uh, the idea is to have a detector that is composed by 60 silicon carbide detector put in a stack configuration as reported here in the picture. Uh, and, and, uh, in this way, it's possible to uh, have an information about the dose as reported here uh, because from each device uh, we will measure uh, the, the charge and then through uh, um, a calibration procedure know the dose. So uh, this is uh, uh, um, results that we obtained just with a single detector just to uh, test the dependence of the device with the LAT of the particle and seems that works very well in a very large range of LAT, between 2 kV per micron up to 20 kV per micron. So uh, the detector will be designed to work in a wide range of protons, uh, ener proton energy, um, starting to 30 MeV up to 150 MeV. And uh, as you can see also in the picture, the idea is to have an information also about a biological dose because uh, it should be possible to insert inside the detector itself a biological layer. So, uh, but uh, why the silicon carbide detector? Because, because our idea is to use a new generation of silicon carbide with a, a large area detector because the dimension of this device is uh, 15 per 50 millimeter square and 10 micron in thickness. 
And uh, as respect to the other detectors, uh, for example, uh, diamond and silicon, the silicon carbide is a very promised material because for the, firstly, for the depth dose uh, reconstruction, we have to remember that for us it's important uh, that the atomic number uh, be something uh, close to the, LT, so to the tissue. And uh, the atomic uh, number, the effectiveness atomic number of tissue is seven. So this means that if we compare, firstly, the silicon carbide with the silicon, the silicon carbide is, is better. So uh, if we give a look to the energy gap, uh, you know the uh, silicon carbide is similar to the diamond, so this means that we have a good signal to noise ratio. And uh, another important thing is uh, the threshold displacement energy. That uh, if we compare, in fact, this number uh, with the silicon, we can notice that it for sure is better. This means that we have uh, a detector that is uh, uh, exhibiting with an high radiation hardness, because this is the energy that you have to release to the material to uh, produce a, a permanent damage in the crystal. So, uh, as I already told you, the Prague detector prototype was uh, already realized just with four detectors, as reported here in the picture and was already tested with 30 MeV proton beam <coughs> In, uh, in Czech Republic, uh, with also a preliminary test was performed with a laser at the INO CNR and a proton therapy center in Trento. Here I will show you just the experimental results that we obtained with the 70 MeV at the proton therapy center of Trento. So this means that uh, is uh, uh, a standard, uh, we use a standard Bragg peak, uh, not a spread out Bragg peak, with uh, a fluence that is not extremely high in this, uh, in this case. So uh, um, we decided uh, to compare the response of the, of the four silicon carbide detector with uh, a stack of a BT3, a BT3 film, that is a gaff chromic film that are used, currently are used in clinical practice and uh, can be adopted as reference for dosimetric purposes. So you can notice that the peak to plateau ratio obtained with the silicon carbide and the BT3, it's uh, very good because the discrepancy is uh, um, the order of 4%, that is extremely low. <clears throat> So, uh, just to conclude, which are the future perspectives in the LNS? I want to spend a few words about this because uh, we get money for the installation of a laser also at LNS. I don't know if you know, but in our laboratory we, uh, we have uh, a cyclotron and a tandem now. So, with a cyclotron, with this, these two machines, it's possible to accelerate ions with energy up to 80 MeV <coughs> per nucleon. So, now we the installation of a laser will be possible to have at disposal another source for protons, electrons, and also to start some studies of the interaction between the, 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 the beam produced by the cyclotron and the tandem with the plasma. So here uh, I reported the sketch of this new facility that will be installed. <coughs> you can notice that, okay, we have the laser room, but also two interaction chambers. One will be dedicated for, uh, to the uh, acceleration, the production of the protons, ions, and electrons, and another one for the study of the interaction between uh, the beams produced by the cyclotron and tandem with the plasma. So uh, the laser that will be installed uh, will be a um, five, 500 terawatt laser. Um, with a short pulse duration and high repetition rate. In this uh, way, it will be possible to accelerate protons with energy up to uh, 40 MeV and electrons with energy up to 800 MeV. So uh, our idea, of course, is uh, to uh, install a laser that can be upgradable up to one petawatt to have at disposal up to 100 MeV of protons. Okay, th thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Diana, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, questions? Everyone is hungry, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. <laughs> ah, there on top is a question, yeah.
Yeah, thanks for the very interesting talk. What is the target material you, you, you are using? Uh, you can use uh, plastic but also metallic target uh, for the acceleration of the charged particles such as protons or ions. For example, in the pre-commissioning phase, uh, we used both. But of course, uh, if you have an high repetition rate laser, it uh, should be better also use a liquid target. Uh, in fact, we are also uh, studying different solutions with, uh, just with water because in the, with the water you have a continuous uh, flow of the, of the target uh, and uh, you are not uh, uh, correlated to the movement uh, of the target because uh, in each shot uh, the target is destroyed. So uh, it uh, could be a problem. <laughs> So I can't see any raising hands. So thanks again.